Today's guest is Jane Monica Jones, a true financial healer. She's a global leader in financial therapy and trauma-informed financial well-being. As the co-founder of the Financial Wellbeing Company, Jane focuses on transforming people's core relationships with money. She's the author of The Billionaire Buddha, in which she delves into both the spiritual and the practical aspects of financial health. Jane also hosts her own podcast called Financial Therapy and offers a space for genuine and compassionate conversations about our economic lives. With her unique blend of wisdom and compassion, Jane is reshaping how people think about and relate to money, not just in Australia, but on a global scale. Welcome, Jane. Thanks, Ash. Gia, it sounds like a nice person you're about to interview. <laughs> <laughs> I think I could have possibly put in humour as well. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Nice one. Thank you for having me on your show. It's just, it's an absolute delight to be here. Oh, and it's yeah, it's truly wonderful to to have you here and be able to share your insights around money and and trauma. And I found I did a webinar with you, which was a somatic experiencing event, and I was a participant listening to you sharing your wisdom, and I just found it so helpful and particularly, and I just thought, who in the world doesn't have trauma around money? Mm. Um, I don't know. I, I was going to say the Queen and the Dalai Lama, but I think they probably both do um, as well. Yeah. Or, you know, um, no, I don't think anyone has um, doesn't have a level of trauma around money because money is not money in my belief. It's, it's, um, issues with thriving and issues with survival uh so we if we take money out of it so often we can have those real genuine challenges am i going to survive or am i going to thrive here and i think our history is very strong in guiding our capacity to be with uh yeah can i expand can i grow or, or what are the forces that stop me from being able to do that whether that's external or internal um and i think yeah it's it's a, a fascinating lens of which i get more and more fascinated fascinated about it particularly working with people or talking with people and understanding people's background and their history um and when we look at trauma i think you know we used to just have it as a very narrow thought that you know if I was in a war or PTSD or something quite grave but actually we're starting to get a very broad, broad definition of trauma and that is you know developmental trauma challenges that happened to us when we were kids or shock trauma in a way COVID has impacted us greatly as a form of shock trauma or so shock social trauma meaning that we all went through it and just as we're experiencing the, you know, a loss of a job or a divorce or losing money in the stock market, that is an experience of a, a level of, of, of financial trauma. So it's a very broad category I, I, um, and, and it has many faces and many situations, sometimes individual, sometimes social, uh, sometimes systemic Um when you know when we look at women and money, there's often systemic trauma around financial um, issues that we don't have maybe support for childcare or superannuation and things like that. So yeah, it's a good lens to look at it. The nature of trauma and money. Mm. Yeah, and I think it impacts so much. You know, money is you know it's like food really, and and correlates to food and that primal part of the brain. Yet we live in a society that you know, compared to what life used to be like for human beings, we're in this thrival phase, but then mm. there's this survival survival structure of the brain where that's that real primal must survive, must, must protect my family, must secure the resources. And if I can't secure the resources, be, be in a state of unrest until I secure the resources, or if I do have the resources, I must hold on to the resources, which um, I've got a question for you about that later in regards mm. to, to people not spending. So they accumulate wealth, but not spend. Um, but before we get into that, I'm curious about how you came to be connecting trauma work with, with finances. Um. 
I, th- I suppose my journey started, so I did a lot of personal development work. Initially, when I started out on personal development, I looked at that kind of wealth creation abundance um, piece. And um, I was, you know, because my I knew that I was intelligent, smart person, yet I was really struggling around my finances, like earning a lot and then losing a lot or having lots of self-esteem around, you know, I feel like there's something a bit more for my life yet. I'm working, you know, in jobs that I didn't really appreciate and, and didn't really allow myself to shine somehow. So that's how I sort of started this journey was I wanted to just have a bigger life, something that was a bit more nourishing. And I focused on the wealth creation route that a lot of people do But through this process, I started to see that it was somewhat a little um, spiritually lacking or spiritually lack of nourishment, you know, that the money is kind of the be all and end all. And actually, isn't there something a bit deeper than that? So then I moved away from that and started to follow a bit more of a spiritual path. But then I realized I had to still pay my rent. (laughs) You know, it was like I'm kind of rejecting wealth creation, but I can't go to the spiritual route because actually that's not really paying my rent. So I wanted to find something in between. So I retrained to become a therapist and I started to see that there was this thing around money that was more than just numbers because we often look at money and we think, oh, it's just numbers. If I have the right numbers, I'm going to be good at it. And the more that I've delved into this subject, the more I say it's not about numbers. It's everything. It's kind of soft skills. And what we call soft skills are confidence, empowerment, the capacity to manage risk, the capacity to manage stress, to be creative, to have a level of resilience. So these are all soft qualities that if we support promote and support them in ourselves. we can be more confident not just in or more capable not just in our relationship with money but in in many areas of our life so that is money and I wanted to get curious that you know that maybe in that what I started to discover was is that my need for money was actually my need for recognition in a way that I didn't feel fulfilled in or my my need for money was actually that I didn't have a lot of self-esteem and a lot of self-love yeah Mm -hmm. so I started to use the lens as money to inquire around my own internal landscape where I felt lacking in value or lacking in esteem or lacking in confidence I was trying to project out onto money if I just had money that maybe I could get those and so it became a journey of looking at where money takes me who am I around money? Uh, it, and it's fascinating in that way. You know, often we have these narratives and social cues to say that if you have a certain level of money, then you have a certain level of success. Now, that in our world is, you know, money and, and having a lot of money is rewarded as being successful. It doesn't matter that you might be a really terrible person and you might be destroying the planet or your loved ones. But we deem that as being successful. And I am hopefully reprogramming or rethinking the way that we look at that because I certainly have clients in my financial therapy practice who have spent most of their life in uh, trying to achieve this financial level of financial success and have got to a stage where it feels a little vacuous and feels a little bit like, what was I doing my whole life for around this? Mm-hmm. Um, and and this is where I was going for myself, and so I was tr- have been used or and continue to use to look at this wounding that I have, then I think everybody has to some level of of self discovery, and it has yeah kind of enriched my life in a way I would have never have thought. Um, yeah, that's kind of the short part of there was a kind of a pivotal moment. That really shifted it into gear for me. I don't know if you want me to share a little bit yeah, about please that. Do. Yeah, please well, do. It's beyond turning points. So, yeah, I'd love to hear yeah. that. Um, so personal development, doing a whole lot of personal development. You know, we, we come from um, a background of 
the work that the Path for Trades does. Uh, I was um, working for Path for Trades, which is a, a seven day uh, personal development work. And I was working on staff for them. And I woke, I had a dream one night. And in the dream, I was basically being told that I was, you know, something had happened with the sound equipment. I had broken the sound or it had broken. And, and I was like, blamed for it and I was like well hang on I didn't break this thing and anyway shouldn't you have insurance and whatever and they were like well since you are responsible for this you're out you're out of this community and I was like what? hang on why am I out of the community um because of this financial experience basically it was about trying to recoup the the broken equipment whatever it was about anyway I woke up and I was like oh, well if that had happened I couldn't afford it at this moment in my life I just couldn't afford to fix something like that and that I was kind of being pushed out of of this community this is the story of the dream anyway I was it just really ruptured me this odd dream I was like my god there's this thing around money that could keep me alienated or it could keep me excluded and the work of path of love is to do a lot of self-inquiry and I ended up speaking to some people in in at breakfast just going you know I had this most amazing dream and it was all about money and how if I didn't have money to repair something I was kind of out and I thought you know we don't inquire enough about our relationship with money you know beyond its figure or zero or millions we don't actually look at the relationship with it and so I was like I'm really curious around this because it's not money it's everything around it it's rather whether levels of success or failure or feelings of potency or impotency or all that sort of stuff and I was like this is a subject that needs more inquiry um, in myself as well as I think um, in in the world as well so it really from that odd dream in a, in a personal development workshop I had created my life in a way of curiosity around where money takes us uh, I mean it's the same in relationship you know where do I go around my relationship am I um, able to have nurturance and support or am I, is it challenge and and uh devastating and this is the same that the relationship with money can often give us is it either feels very supportive or it can feel very challenging so yeah it, it's created my life essentially and I wouldn't have picked it <laughs> somehow <laughs> that this crazy dream um but it's been a big theme and and it's yeah it's it's a gift actually to be able to look at this very painful wounding that a lot of us challenge uh challenge by yeah, I, it's it's something that I find quite unique on your the way that you work with people and work with money, and it's for me it's one of those aha moments. Was like, why aren't more people working like this? Why why is there such a disconnection to realizing the links between money and the social, the emotional state of, of people. And, and for myself too, you know, I've been working on my money beliefs and, and actually I, I can't quite remember what's on my post note here, but these are three beliefs that I've been working on. In, and that is money comes to me effortlessly. People value my work and pay me well, and money gives me freedom now and in the future. And, you know, to get to those three beliefs, I had to process things that I had misconstrued about money. Um, if I, let's, how would you know that someone has a healthy relationship with money, with financial well-being? Yeah, look, it, it's interesting. A lot of people get quite shocked when they ask me, I'm not a big money mindset believer and I'm not really into the kind of abundance concept either mm -hmm. um that comes from you know psychophysiology or neuropsychology and meaning that when we feel let me just kind of go back mm -hmm. our nervous system is a very intelligent being essentially it knows it can orientate us towards safety and good and support and health 
and it can also feel uh, a little out of sync in being able to do that yeah now depending on the nature of our traumatic experiences we are in a nervous system that knows what is healthy and and good for us or we are attracted to maybe what's not healthy and good for us depending on the nature of our trauma in a way our warning signal signal gets knocked offline because of trauma Mm. so if we are stuck in those, you you would know it as fight, flight, and freeze physiology, the threat response. Uh, in those physiological states, fight, flight, and freeze, we have a very particular psychology. So in the fight psycho- psychology, everything is a struggle. I never have to get ahead. Everyone's trying to fuck me over, whatever it is, yeah? That clouds our way of of being same with flee yeah Mm -hmm. i i have to avoid it it's all just too much for me i'm out of there it's not important you know abundance kind of can be in that oh if i just you know a, a sort of focus on abundance then maybe i'll get saved yeah we would say that that's in the field of the flight i'm kind of out a little bit and then freeze freeze is Helplessness and hopelessness. Often the capacity when we're, our nervous system is stuck in freeze, we feel helpless and we feel hopeless. Oh, I can't do this. I can't change. The life, you know, life's never supporting me. You know, no one's on my side. Yeah. So when we're stuck in these chronic physiological states of heightened threat response, we have very distinctive psychology. Now, often what happens in these psychologies, we have to train ourselves to think something different. Yeah. It's almost like uh, it's the, the seduction of trauma, we would say, is trying to figure out if I can just affirmate myself out of here or if I can just get myself in the right mindset, I'll be able to get out. Yeah. It's actually counterintuitive because actually when we're in a down-regulated state in our nervous system, what we would call as rest, digest, and repair, there is no mind. We're in absolute flow. There's no need to talk ourselves into it because we are already there. We are present, pretty in the flow, not too much mind shatter, and we don't have to affirmate ourselves into it. Yeah? We don't have to talk ourselves into it. I would say... Because the body feels calm... Because it's regulated, the mind goes quiet and it can orientate from the gut, from the belly, from the heart to the, to, yep, that's a good opportunity over there. That's a good person over there. Mm, No, that doesn't feel right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when we're going into the mind, usually ruminating, we would say, ah, that person is most likely in some sort of threat physiology. The physiology doesn't feel safe whether real or perceived. Now, when we look at it more primal level, we'd say, okay, so the tiger is there, the monster is there, the the beast. So then, of course, we go into that fight, flight, and freeze. But because of our trauma or because of our history, perceived threat, if I stay in this relationship, um, you know, I'm not going to survive. If I leave that relationship, I'm not going to survive. If I think about stepping out and making a bigger life for myself, I'm not going to survive, right? So all that perception. So often when that fear arises or that wobbliness arises, we we go into this practice of trying to affirmate ourselves to try and regulate the nervous system. But in actual fact, when a more regulated nervous system doesn't need to talk itself into that, it goes, I feel the fear and I do it anyway. So um, it's a little bit of a different take, you know, I would say that anyone that's highly affirmating, highly having to talk, I would say, ah, you're probably highly charged, highly dysregulated and need to talk yourself into this rather than actually I'm really grounded and I know exactly I've got what it takes. It's a very different physiological experience and it's a very different psychological experience. In a way, we we think less when we're more regulated mm. um, than, than if we're highly stressed, highly stuck in a high threat physiology. We're more likely to be, oh, if I could just, you know, if I, yeah, if I just affirmate 10 times a day, I'll be able to get there, you know? Yeah. It has a different quality. So do you think affirmations are helpful? 
Uh, no, not necessarily. It would it, as as a practitioner, I would say I can see that you don't seem very regular right, regulated right now. Let's look at why you're stuck mm-hmm. in that threat physiology. I don't affirmate, and my life once you know what what I think the hook or the the challenge can sometimes be is I'm better able now to be with whatever is. I am better able to be with challenge, and I'm better able to be with support right when I felt more dysregulated it, I was unable to be with it so I would go you know if I just affirmate or if I just dream or if I just visualize I can take myself out of this painful experience mm. but the more that I've built capacity for myself I can just be in the uncomfortable mm-hmm. but I have to think myself out into something else because I'm more I have capacity to be with sometimes life's hard and I'm still here. Yeah. Yeah. There, in a way, sometimes, and I'm, I'm not t- saying throw it out. If it supports you, if it regulates you, if it soothes you, go for it. But mm-hmm. if it you use it every time because you're challenged, then I would say as a practitioner, I would really be keen to look at how can we get you a little bit more regulated so that you're not trying to find these bombs outside, like, well, when I'm rich, I'll be better, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm. how can you be right here and be okay yeah rich or poor Mm. yeah that makes sense because so there's a a longing to be wealthy right a longing i don't know if longing is the correct correct word but you know there's this attachment to being wealthy but then i i can't access and have the capacity to generate wealth if my nervous system's elevated because then I'm just reacting and I'm. And ruminating, my, 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 like reacting yeah. and rumi- ruminating. Yeah, right. exactly. Say, say those together 10 times fast. That's <laughs> <laughs> reacting and ru- ruminating. There we go. Right. <laughs> if you're listening, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and, and this is where the, this is where healing happens is not in the avoidance, not in the, 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 if I affirmate, I will get out there. Healing happens when I can go, can I just be with that really shaky part of me that doesn't know where the next gig is coming from, mm. you know? And when I'm in that shaky place, what happens? Do I undersell myself? Do I, for want of a better word, prostitute myself just to get what I need to do? Or am I able still to speak up to say, this is my value? Mm. See, this is where transformation happens is being in the capacity to be with the uncomfortability, to be with the uncomfortability rather than going into some uh, visualization or affirmation or being out, you know, mm. it, 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 the transform happens in when we can be with the capacity to be with our pain in a way mm-hmm. and discover where we go when we're in pain. Do I sell myself short when I'm in pain? Do I take crumbs when I'm in pain? This is good territory for you to get to go. I'm in pain and I'm still going to say, no, here's my bill for a thousand bucks, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what comes to mind is, so there's a disconnection to self and there's a disconnection to value for self because there's fear or, or a fear response. And then, so would I be right that people then manifest that in many, many different ways? But for one example, the doing a job that they don't like and that they it comes out of fear and then doing that job, you know, 40 hours a week, five days a week, and it's then impacts their whole ecosystem and it's because of the fear of money. So am I on the right track there? You are, you're close. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Let's say I'm doing a job that I hate. Yeah. When I contemplate the idea of doing something else, I go, oh, oh I don't know if I can do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what maybe when you've had the physiological experience of like that in the past, that may have been actual danger or 
you know, we know in the work that we've done is, is that often when we seek to grow, we will hit the edge of our contraction, you know, our inner critic or our saboteur or whatever it is. Oh, no, no, no. Don't think, you know, you're an accountant. Don't, you, you can't go off and be a lion tamer. Hang on. No, no, no. You know. Yeah. yeah. But it's in what happens when we seek to grow. Oh, no, I want to be a lion tamer. All of our conditioning will come rushing in and it'll wobble literally the nervous system. <gasps> I don't know whether I should do that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe I shouldn't be a lion tamer. I'm an accountant. We've always been accountants. That's who we are. Yeah. But what the thing is, is the wobble is teaching you your edge, right? Okay. See if you can be with the wobble, see if you can unpack. We're always been accountants. See if you can, who am I, if I become, am I going to have friends if I become a lion tamer? As my identity going to be shattered when I become alive? That's the edge that you have to start working with there, yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, all of that is that wobble, is the fear response. Now, often, because of the nature of our nervous system, fear indicates danger. But this is a perception that there's danger. It's a social perception of danger of your upbringing, your belief structures and all that sort of stuff. And so we've coupled that physiological fear of experience of, of fear or worry or whatever it is with all the narratives about our conditioning and what we are and aren't able to do, yeah? Mm -hmm. But in fact, that's the edge that we have to work and play in and to, to reprogram our nervous system or not the nervous, not change the nervous system, but be able to bear it and say, this is just fear. And it's going to throw up all this psychic material that you're not good enough and you shouldn't. And, you know, who the hell do you think you are going off and wanting to be a lion tamer? It's going to throw up all this psychological material to stop you. But in actual fact, it's the gift, right? I'm at fear. It's okay. Woo. Okay. Ground myself. What supports me to get grounded? Mm. What supports me to rest and digest and repair, you know? going off and having a, a glass of water, go for a walk, have some meditation, really spend, get a hug from someone. Yeah. Yeah. You're just wobbly right now. Come on. You're just wobbly. It's okay. Come on. You know, mm. don't listen to the things in your head, you know, just here you come. And then that's it. Is that my kind of getting mm -hmm. you there? Yeah. And so the, so the wobble happens and then it, it's a gift in that it's showing me my edge, but also it can give me insights around why the wobble is happening. Uh, it could. I mean, we know in trauma, it's not essential to know why it happened and why it got laid down, but you can mm -hmm. just start to get to know. And that's why I like to say wobble rather than fear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it just takes the judgment because we go, you know, there's a whole lot of, if you know, feel the fear, do it anyway, whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. you know <laughs> embracing the wobble yeah embrace it yeah woo, it's wobbly okay show yourself up a little you know get grounded take a couple of breaths the thing is is that then this is like often say with clients is when you're signing a million dollar mortgage you're gonna be wobbly mm. it's just natural but you can bear it the difference between the person that's following their dream and not following dream is they can bear the wobble. Mm -hmm. They haven't changed their mindset. They're just being able to bear their, they have the capacity to be with their shaky. Mm -hmm. And I, I really, I've got this really lovely um, anecdote that I really got this piece. And it was, so a soccer, I was talking to a soccer woman, soccer um, footballer, and a couple of years ago, and she was saying that she used to get to this stage where when the ball was coming at her, she would freeze, yeah, mm -hmm. and want to, I can't do this, yeah. And then she worked out and went, oh, I'm freezing. Huh, what if I lean in a little bit? And then that broke for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she just went, ah. Oh, yeah, it's normal. I, it freezes normal. It's okay. Can I lean in a little bit? Can I just lean in a little bit more? Mm. And then it broke for her that it's just that, yeah, this physiology, this nervous system, this so this person's experiences said, when it comes to the crunch, I get, I freak out. Yeah. Now, maybe for years and years and years, when it came to the crunch, you'd take off, you'd fight, you'd freeze, whatever. Or can you just be with it this time? 
mm. and say that it's actually just my nervous system going, woo, 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 mm. and I'm okay, you know, and that's mm. going to take a little practice. You might get some work, some, someone to support you around that. But just to say what's happening in your body right now as you think about going and following your dreams. <gasps> well, my heart is pounding. I feel like I'm going to throw up. Yeah. Okay, great. Can you just be with it for a little bit? You know, and then you go, well, I feel like I'm going to throw up and my heart is pounding and I'm still here. Yeah. So actually maybe I could follow my dreams because let me, I think we think, or I used to think that, well, to follow my dreams, I have to be totally confident and totally grounded. No, you don't have to. Mm -hmm. You can follow your dreams being completely wobbly. Yeah. And then you get to the next stage and then that wobbles you and the next one and next one, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so you don't have to be true. anything different than any than you are. That's often, you know, and I mean, I kind of a little bit that I used to look at those wealth creation gurus and I go, but yeah, but I'm not a man and I don't have that level of confidence and I don't have that kind of, I don't look great in a suit, you know, <laughs> so I can't do it. But, I, mm. you know, my, my approach is about how can I get this nervous system to shine, mm. you know, with your capacity your quality your capacity to be whatever you know to be to, to let's just lean in a little bit you know often we get this cook you know around finances too there's so much well we'll do what i did and you'll make a fortune well i'm not you you know mate you know i'm me yeah. I support me to thrive it's um it's very powerful the perspective because when i'm if I can be with the wobble and be here and be present, then that emotional reaction to get wealth, generate wealth, spend money, gamble it, whatever it is, it takes the power away from that. And it and then it's this, this, there's a, what I'm, I'm speaking as I'm, you know, processing mm. the information, but it's, I will have the capacity to be happy wherever the fuck I am, if I can be with the wobble, regardless of how much money, you know, within reason, regardless of how much money is coming in or going out. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, that, you know, in a way, that's my, my modus operandi is, is that you don't abandon yourself when you're at your lowest, you know, your lowest financially or your lowest in opportunity, whatever that is. And we often do. We completely abandon our safe and say, well, you know, um, I'm I'm not valuable or I'm not contributing or whatever it is. And this is that territory. We have to be, be with ourselves when we are struggling, when we haven't, um, when we're working in that job that we hate. We have to learn to be, fill our place in that place and be the self-love. You know, rather than going, I want to be, I'm so, this is too excruciating. I want out. I want to be him. I want to be her, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is the true self-love that this is, money can teach us self-love in this way. Or the lack of money can also teach us self-love, you know. Mm -hmm. um, that, that yeah, that it, it's a fabulous lens in this way, you know. And I think we think that, oh, well, I must have a whole lot of self-love if I have lots of money. Well, then that doesn't necessarily equate. You know, you might have a whole lot of self-esteem issues and need to prop yourself up with lots of money, you know. Mm. So it, it works both ways. Um, yeah. But, yeah, this is it. It's it's this. How can – are you abandoning yourself around your financial situation? You know, um, that's my always my curiosity. And often we do. We do because it's like I can't thrive. I can't survive. I, you know, I, I abandon myself because I'm not thriving or I'm not surviving, you know? Mm, yeah. What about people who who hold on to their wealth and they're, they're too afraid or or there's always this, oh, something bad might happen, I need to keep this, and they're missing out on the experience of what that money can provide. Is there any insights you have on that? Yeah. So I do have a category of clients that I call debilitating wealthy, debilitatingly wealth. Debilitatingly yeah. wealthy, right? Eh? Yeah. Yeah. So that often that 
and it, it has different histories. Some of it could be that they became wealthy because of the nature of a death or a trauma or something like that. Um, and, or, you know, levels of inheritance that they didn't make it and the fear that they might lose it if they touch it and work with it and all that sort of stuff because they didn't, they didn't make it, you know. Um, and also too, and, and lots of clients that have come because one, you know, in relationship, one party's got freely can spend freely with the money and the other one's not you know mm. and this is again it's whatever the, it's the conditioning you know if I spend that am I going to spend it all you know mm -hmm. it, it's often the narrative like if I just start then I'm going to open the floodgates well actually you know you're a you're an adult and you know you understand limitation and you're allowed to have a bit of um play and and enjoy some of the fruits of what you've got so it is it's a it, it it's odd but it happens on the other scale that people just cannot because of their trauma because of their histories cannot find a level of um, support or safety and often it can be that they don't have never really truly arrived you know they still feel like if they've made didn't have much money and then finally made it they don't get that they've actually arrived yet and so we'll do some sort of is there a part of you that actually feels like you might have actually achieved where you wanted to go all these years? And just that little, actually, yeah, I can just kind of get it now, you know? Mm -hmm. The nervous system's not running constantly. I still got to get it. I still got to, you know, fight, fight, fight. Can you just get that maybe you do have $10,000, $10 million sitting in the bank account, whatever it is, you know? Yeah. Actually, yeah, I can. Oh, I can feel it a little bit. And they may take that breath for the first time. So arriving can be just that little piece that I might work with someone, you know, that can you feel that there is that money in there? Or it could be that it could be what we'd say is coherence. You know, I feel like, oh, nothing's functioning, you know, like I'm I'm a disaster in my relationships. I'm a disaster with the little bit that I use or, or whatever it is, you know, I'm a disaster with my mental health so that, you know, I'm sensed a reason I'm going to be a disaster with the money. Well, actually, the fact that you got here in this session says that something's kind of working and that we might look at, well, you know, you've got a lot of stable friendships and things like that. Do you think we can see what's working and apply that to your potential capacity to be with this money and just to work? Oh, yeah, maybe I can. Oh, okay, I can relax now. Yep, 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 you know. So often it is, it's, because money, as you know, as I spoke in that that talk, money is not money. Money is activation, you know. So large amounts of money can be very activating, very highly triggering, mm. just as the lack of money is also highly triggering. Often I have people that have, um, you know, got money from an inheritance, started to spend a lot and gone, you know what, I'm spending too much because and they've come to see me because they're like, oh, my God, if I keep going this way, I'm going to go through the whole thing. And it's almost because the nervous system can't bear this big amount of money. So they start wanting to get rid of it in a way. You mm -hmm. know, it's too much. I can't bear it. I'll just start spending it because it's just too much for my nervous system. Yeah. Because the money is going to take a level of due diligence, knowledge, self-regulation, self-modulation, maybe some more research, more management, talking to more people, all that sort of stuff. And you go, oh, actually, I can't bear that. Boom, I'm going to start giving it away. I'm going to start mm -hmm. doing crazy holidays with everybody down the street, you know? Yeah. And so we give it away because the nervous system can't bear it. Right. And that that's running in the subconscious that they, they, they're not, well, you know, most people, they're not aware that it's running in the subconscious. It's driving the behaviors. It's not where that it hits their nervous system this way, I would say. It's not, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I'm not really into, I, I don't talk in that level. I would say that, it, you know, all oh, this money, oh, I don't want to look at it. It's, we literally go, I can't do it. We yeah. want to, you know, what's happened, as you, I, if we're watching this on video, I'm actually turned away from it because I can't bear it. Mm. The body doesn't want it. Yeah. I think a and lot then, of people are like that with tax returns. Exactly. Yeah. The mm. body doesn't want it. And so then it sets up, oh, I hate this thing. I hate the system. Or I hate that they my mother, you know, gave me this money or my whatever it is. Yeah. Or oh, I'm pathetic with money. 
That's a good one. You know, mm. boom, I've gone straight and attacked myself because of it. And do you yeah. think that's a re when people say that I'm pathetic with money, is that a like a reinforcing thing? And it's a self is a prophesizing. Is that the right? No, I wouldn't say that it's self prophesizing. I would say the nature of the freeze or the avoidant physiology. We get help, feel helpless and hopeless. Yeah. It's when we are in freeze, when we are stuck, we go, oh, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. It's just the, it's the, it's a threat response. Mm, a response mm. to threat is we go into helplessness and hopelessness or self criticism. And so if someone feels they're in that response, AKA wobbly, then the, the art is being with it being with the can I can I be with this right now yeah and can I yeah support myself to come a bit more grounded because mm. what happens in our physiology is when we're stressed which is a normal human function that is meant to be time limited a whole lot of cortisol goes into our body yeah now cortisol's um, purpose is to get us very focused on the task or the threat yeah but what happens in that is cognition slightly goes down yeah so it makes us go full rainbow spectrum of thinking then when cortisol comes it goes red 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 now when we want to be good with money we need to have the rainbow thinking we need creativity we need to have flexibility Thing. But if we're looking red, 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 we're not getting that, yeah? Mm -hmm. Because the body's going, I'm under threat, I'm under threat, I'm like, I can't think straight. You can't think of, where's, there's no money, there's no money in the bank, there's no money in the bank. Whereas when we're a bit more regulated and, and supported and grounded, we go, well, there's no money in the bank, but I know that my pay is coming in and you know what, I might be able to get a loan or actually I'm going to reach out to a friend and maybe get some more work or actually I feel confident enough to go for a job yeah mm. so when we're in this high state and thing is we, we get very narrow focus because we're trying to perceive the threat and the threat is no money in the bank account but when we're grounded and resourced we can we, we open up again we go yeah okay yeah I'm, I'm a I'm a um uh a tenacious flexible creative person right okay boom here i go work out my financial problem yeah 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 and speaking of resources you've got an online platform with educational resources and you've got your book billionaire buddha yeah so i do i have a, a uh it's a, a learning platform called capability and that's capability ending in an e.com i'm sure it's in the show notes yeah, so it is a learning platform. It's like the Netflix of financial well-being. It's got lots of basic, you know, understanding budgets, um, debt, repayments, understanding spending, uh, as well as insurance and buying a house and all those sort of practical things around our financial literacy, as well as it has lots of courses on financial psychology and financial behavior. So it's a beautiful mix of uh, small. Most of the courses are around 15 minutes. There are long form uh, personal development courses around financial saboteur or inner critic or um, building financial boundaries. So there's long form courses in there, but it's kind of like the Netflix of financial well-being essentially. So, yeah, and it's a, it's on sale. It's, it's currently been reduced down to $24 US a year. Wow. for a year's subscription so it's really cheap at the moment mm -hmm. so i recommend yeah. rushing in there yeah i i have had a little browse i think i'll sign up by the way i have had a little browse and i was really impressed by the the breadth of information that's available yeah and look you know it was always that idea that it's you know 24 7 on demand basically it's less than your oh maybe oh no i think it is it's less than your netflix subscription <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much so, very much so. And and what about your book? Yeah, so my book, Billionaire Buddha, which is it's kind of financial therapy for it looks at the nature of our everything we've been speaking about. You know, money is pain, money is stress, money is shame, and shame is part of that piece. That again, it's that hopelessness, helplessness. Um, 
place that we go when we feel kind of freezing or frozen around money as well as i have my money mental health series of um, cards which is money mental health card series which are these beautiful little resources where you can do lots of uh personal inquiry about your relationship with money as well mm. yeah because so uh, what i'm getting from your perspective on how to heal the relationship with money is to be with the discomfort to become more regulated firstly firstly, firstly yeah the yeah. more regulated the you are the more able you are to be able to be in those heightened states when they happen mm. yeah mm. see the thing is is that our normal day to day is our nervous system goes up down up down up down yeah i'm here on this call here a door bang <gasps> i'm up here oh look around no there's no threat yeah mm. and then i come back down into rest and digest yeah. When we are stuck in chronic states of fight, flight, and freeze, which is high activation in the nervous system, all those terrible things happen. Yeah. We can't think straight. We can't, everything seems like a threat. This the world is not supporting me, all that sort of stuff. The more that we come out of that for the next time that we need to come go back up and down and up and down, because that's a normal nervous system, up, down, up, down, the better able we can be with it. Now, when we are, in those chronic states, yeah, can we be with it a little bit better, you know? And the more that we have rest, digest and repair, down-regulated, the better able we're able to be at the top and then we can come back down. Yeah, I think that's something a lot of people miss in life and something that we're not taught is that up, down, up, down and how important the down-regulation is, the, the grounding and that it's, for me, I'll often say that's quite that's more important than the activation time is. is yeah. See, I mean, the problem being is, is that if you're stuck in trauma, then you have no control over it, you know, and I think most of us are trauma traumatized at some level. Um, so dealing with that level of trauma, whether you do it in a somatic practice or in, um, in a, you know, with a therapist or a counselor is going to set you up because you can, what we're trying to do essentially is to get you away from going red, 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 red to go green, blue, yellow, blah, blah, and then red, 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 green, blue, blah, blah, you know, mm -hmm. it's just to to get the brain out of going red, 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 because it cut, you know, carves in a a, a chronic um everything is red and and this is the whole world when we can start if i can point you to green and blue and purple then the then the nervous system goes oh yeah 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 there is a, another way mm. um and, and 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 that's in the moment it's not in the future it's in the moment you know look yeah. you know you're you've you've got yourself into this this course or you got yourself into this practice room or look at that you're still paying your bills those are those green yellow moments that go yeah I am pay paying my bills. Good. All right. Let's mm. build yourself from there. You know. Yeah, because that, that's a big one that the people fear the future, and of course the mind loves to go worst case scenario. It's like, oh, here's a little bit of discomfort or pain. The mind goes, okay, turn it to eleven, as you you call it, the red zone. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Interesting. I was I was listening to something the other day, and it was about this man was talking about how he went scuba diving. And it was in Iceland and so freezing cold water and he'd never done a dive like that. And he basically had a freak out underwater and he told the instructor he had to go straight up. So he went straight up and uh, he was having a panic attack at the top of the water. <laughs> and the instructor said, you see those mountains there? Look how beautiful they are. Yeah, but he, he just paused and he and his nervous system just went. Hmm. Yeah, and that's often what we do. So you know, when we're in isolation, because also too in these high activated states, we go into I'm alone, mm. and what we often need is that regulating other that says, "Look at the mountains, you're okay," mm. you know. So the in and this is the challenge around money, because there's a lot of when we get, because it's so vulnerable making, we go into isolation and all the old, you know, cues and prompts to say we shouldn't talk about money or money, don't be emotional about money. All of those things keep us very isolated, yeah, when in fact we want to be in community when we are struggling, yeah, mm -hmm. because community to be in connection is the place that we can 
go to another regulated being to help. I mean, most of my work is I'm that regulating nervous system as you talk about your your you know your isolation about your financial situation i am that compassionate container that most of the world is saying yeah you're a failure what's wrong with you you can't look after your your finances i'm like going yeah no we'll wonder with your upbringing absolutely you should be terrible mm. with money all right let's work with this you know yeah. so it it's a it's a it's a it's a paradox, the place of which we need so much connection. We're often told that we can't go reach out to get the support because of these, you know, it's just not safe. It's not there's not a lot of psychological safety around money, essentially. Yeah, yeah. it's it's not very you know it's talked about creating wealth, but it's it's not talked about a lot around the personal impact of of money. The question i have for you is around um intergener intergenerational trauma and the, the history of how our history can impact our perception of money um i don't know if that's quite a question or a statement but do you have any comment on that look it absolutely does and again if we go back to our um our physiology we look at it in the context of levels of cortisol so we know through epigenetics, which is that trace genetic streams go into the nervous system below us. Yeah. So that I have traces of my uh, grandparents in my nervous system and in particular levels of how my body reacts to cortisol, to the stress hormone. Now, if I had a generation of people that were totally chilled, then I'm better able to regulate my cortisol levels but if i had my ancestors going through a depression or going through a famine or going having to run and leave everything through a war their levels of cortisol are going to be very very high and that genetic material will then get passed down into my nervous system so i may have been brought up in australia in a middle class family i still have that fight fight or uh, threat physiology in this nervous system, even though it's lived a really quiet life mm. because it sits that, that my nervous system is built from my ancestors. And if my ancestors have been under adversity, then, then my nervous system is, is perceiving life is adverse. Yeah? yeah. And so then when, again, it's that same, we've always been accountants. Who the hell do you think you're going off to be a, a lion tamer. Ah, oh, we're always accountants. You know, the way you make money is through accountancy. That's it. You can't go off and do an adventurous life being a lion tamer. Mm -mm -mm. You know, Uncle Joe did that 10 years ago and he failed. So there's a perfect example. You can't do it, you know? Yeah. Of course, that is massive influence. You know, we are so conditioned physiologically and sociologically, you know, uh, psychologically um and sociologically you know that uh you 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 make money this way you don't make it you know more broader ways or you know more you know I, I mean even if you wanted to become a doctor no we're not doctors we're engineers you know like that sort of stuff so it could yeah it's very very influential on our um relationship with money is our yeah. ancestry i'm curious about this might, you know, this might be a well. Actually, I think it's a reasonable question. The what would the world look like if we had a world where most of the people were aware of their relationship to money and their being able to be with the wobbliness and and what would what would that be like for in a financial sense? Look, I, I mean. I suppose why I'm really passionate about this area is a couple of reasons. The, the social justice reason, which is that, you know, there is a lot of injustice around that wobbliness that we, I can't bear my wobbliness. So, you know, the world's going to pay basically that can be, you know, or I, you know, we often look at those things where it's just business. Now, most businesses are filled with human beings um, so there is no, it's just business in my, my thing. There is probably, we, we could look at it, that what's happening with those people that are sitting in those organizations that their own 
uh, psychological things that they, they can't care for another human being and another people's um uh life life lively livelihood uh, it would be a very different thing if we could say we could get off we could heal our own wounding around money because in a way when we're in those fight and flight physiology we're alone but when we're in 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 rest and digest right rest digest and repair we're, we're better able to be in a social community we're better able to respond to to others who are asking for help are needing help in the tribe yeah that are signaling us distress yeah but as as a whole world that's kind of in threat they can't see other people distressed they can't see themselves distressed so in a way the the healing of through the lens of money is the healing of, of humanity in a way that we all can have an equal ladle in the, in the big soup, you know, rather than they're getting more and someone's getting less, you know? So there is a real social justice component in it. The other thing I would say is around the climate as we use consuming, as we use our level of um, need to kind of conquer the world, the climate is feeling the impact of that the world will never be enough for the for our the big gaping hole that can never be filled by stuff you know mm -hmm. how many yeah. pairs of shoes i mean you know and i'm i'm absolute an absolute um victim of that or i was you know i had tons mm -hmm. of clothes tons of shoes tons mm -hmm. of chattels um and because i was trying to fill that hole within me that can never be filled with stuff and I think a lot of us are trying to do that and we are consuming the world because of our own um, existential hole or gaping, wounding hole. And, and it's affecting the climate as we just churn out fast fashion, as we keep continuing to buy and buy and buy and experience and, you know, yeah, conquer the world with our, with our emotional distress, essentially. Mm -hmm. So that's, this is the other reason we should look at our money relationship. That, that's my belief. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, it's when I travel, I often if, when I'm flying, I look down and I just see the desolation that that's happened here in Australia. And mm. I remember particularly after the bushfires, I was flying, and I couldn't believe that it just went for probably forty five minutes in a plane. That's you know mm. almost a thousand kilometers of just desolation from the bushfires and. You know, then on top of that, the farming land and, you know, if I, you know, Tasmania is very beautiful, but when I go there, a lot of it is, has been, the forests have been cut down and it's, it's farmland that's not even being used or there's hardly any sheep on it. And when you, when I go to an ancient forest compared to the regen forest, it's, it's mm. like, you know, I compare it to being in an, in this beautiful ancient cathedral and then I go into a demountable. It's, you know, yeah. so the, the greed and, you know, I, he, I hear you about if we could heal the the patterns that are there which drive the greed, we can heal the planet and have a, well, you know, have a planet that's thriving rather than in in, in big distress. Yeah, exactly. So that, you know, that is the, look, I mean, she'll go on without us. <laughs> she'll she'll <laughs> no, take care of in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in a, you know, healthy and personal way. But, mm. but it is, it's somehow that, you know, that's just, you know, um, you know, I mean, it's generation of generation. In a way, it's kind of, I'm, I want to give us a little bit of credit. We've just, this experiment that is humanity is, is mad. And uh, it's been fraught with trauma, 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 trauma. Well, you know, we got a little bit more developed, but we certainly didn't get more um, more healthily developed internally. Mm. Um, and, yeah, so we're just all traumatised, basically. That's it. And, you know, now at the brink, we are probably seeing the nature that tra how, how universal trauma is which is a good thing. It's not just for those that go off to war um, or it's not just those that, you know, had a severe accident or were abused. It is, it is a, it's a global pandemic of which 
we all live in and we think that it's normal, but in actual fact, it's not. And when we are living in a community, feeling highly regulated and stable and um, and resourced, we care about others and we care about the planet. And so this is, this is you know, money is a good lens to see how we don't uh, care about those things and how disconnected and um, and broken we are a little. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you. Thanks, Jane, for coming on Beyond Turning Points. And if people want to get in touch with you, how do they get in touch? And yeah, I'll put just it in the go show to Jane. Well. Jane Monica Jones dot com is the mm. easiest way. Yeah. Mm. And or what is the name of your? On... Oh, sorry, you you go. Oh no, I was just. Or you, you know, we work with organisations around financial wellbeing as well. So that's the Financial Wellbeing Co dot com. Okay. Great. Yeah. And that's the Financial Wellbeing Co is also, I know it was capacity. Capability.com with the name is our, is our platform. <laughs> yeah. So that's yeah. the product under with the, that we have done with the Financial Wellbeing Company, but that's our standalone product. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, for the listeners, I'll pop that in the show notes. And Jane, thank you. Uh, something I'm really taking away is that the being with the wobbly when it happens and realizing you know that happens with spending money but it also happens with hoarding money and and that if i can be with the wobbly it will then increase my capacity if i if i ground at that time it will increase my capacity to manage what's happening around me yeah beautiful that's it yeah and save the planet exactly at the same time <laughs> and save yeah save your community and save your planet yeah all right. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Jane. Thanks, Ash. It's been a delight. Yeah. Thank you. See you.